Okay, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for coming. Thanks so much for coming to Science on Tap Monaco. Our, uh, so happy and so pleased to have everybody in person. I've stopped saying live. I think everybody was already alive. But we are in person here at Oak Fire. Thank you so much for coming. Um, my name is Susan Knight. I'm with the University of Wisconsin Trout Lake Station, just up the up the road a bit on Highway uh, up 51 on um, on Trout Lake. Uh, Science on Tap is an example of the Wisconsin idea, an idea conceived in 1905 that the boundaries of the university are the boundaries of the state. Our partners in Science on Tap include the Monaco Public Library, Lakeland Badger Chapter of the Wisconsin Alumni Association, UW Kemp Natural Resources Station, UW Trout Lake Station, our newest sponsor, WXPR, our wonderful public radio station, and our new hosts here at uh, Oak Fire pizzeria and bar. Thank you so much to everybody. Um, Science on Tap is supported through a grant from the Brittingham Fund of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Just a reminder that there are three ways to watch. You can come and watch us in person, which hopefully we will be able to do from now on. And uh, you can also watch on YouTube from uh, the privacy of your own home. Uh, we will continue that. And you can also watch any event later. We uh, archive all of our videos and you can watch them. Um, anything, again, uh, just go to our website and go to archive videos and you can see um, uh, everything that we've been doing. We've been doing this now for 10 years, so we've got quite the, quite the collection. Um, this is our last event until next October. And uh, we will send out an announcement of that event um, uh, sometime in uh, September, so watch for that, but um, we will uh, take the summer off so that uh, everybody can have fun on the lakes and Oak Fire can have, um, I'm sure they'll have a great business here. Tonight we welcome Karen Oberhauser. She is the director of the University of Wisconsin-Madison Arboretum. Uh, she is professor of entomology and Karen has an undergraduate degree from Harvard University, a degree in science education from UW-Madison, and a PhD in ecology and behavioral biology from University of Minnesota. She's authored over 100 papers on monarchs, insect conservation, and citizen science. And monarch butterfly populations have been declining over the last 25 years, pretty much the same amount of time that they've been following them. Karen believes it is time to move beyond documenting the decline and moving towards uh, responding to this challenge posed by monarch conservation and insect conservation in general. In 1996, she started a nationwide citizen science project called the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project, which continues to engage hundreds of volunteers throughout North America, and she and her students rely on these citizen science volunteers to help with their research. Tonight, she's going to tell us how the monarchs are doing and what she and her students and volunteers have been doing and maybe how the rest of us can help as well. And there will be information about the UW-Madison um, Arboretum on our website. Uh, so if you go to our website, if you don't get information or flyers tonight, you can see uh, lots of information there. And she will talk about the Arboretum, and I encourage everybody to, to visit it if you're ever down on the UW-Madison campus. Okay, here's your trivia question for Karen. In a former life, Karen was living in San Francisco and had an interesting job. What was she doing? Okay, you get to answer this right now. She was a cab driver and once drove Steve Jobs to the airport. Or B... She was a bicycle me messenger and once delivered a package to Iggy Pop. Or C, she was a pizza delivery person and once delivered a pizza to Jerry Garcia. All right. So was it Steve Jobs, Iggy Pop, or Jerry Garcia? Hey. Iggy Pop. Here's Karen. <laughs> Well, I wish I would have gotten to meet Jerry Garcia. <laughs> that would have been fun. 
<laughs> um, so being a bicycle messenger in San Francisco was a lot of fun, but being the director of the UW Madison Arboretum is even more fun. So that's, I'm going to start by talking about the UW Madison Arboretum and then start talking about monarchs. And you are welcome to ask me questions about either one. Um, I'm going to start with a couple things. First of all, um, I would like to recognize that the UW Madison Arboretum occupies ancestral Ho Chunk land. I'd like to acknowledge the circumstances that led to their forced removal and honor the Ho Chunk Nation's history of resistance and resilience. The UW Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho Chunk Nation along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. So, and then I would like to ask if anybody in the audience has a birthday today. <laughs> you do get something very cool, Free. No birthdays today. Okay, let's find the person with the birthday closest to today. So anybody May, close to May 4th? May 7th? Anybody? Nope, I think May 7th is closer. Anybody closer than May 7th? All right. You get a bag with monarch wings on it. <laughs> And ha what is your name? Kelly. Kelly. Happy birthday, Kelly, in three days, May 7th. <laughs> She's 29 and holding. All right, nice. Um, so, so if you didn't win the birthday prize, I have a few more prizes up here. Okay, so first about the UW-Madison Arboretum. How many people in here have ever been to the Arboretum? All right, I would say only about a quarter of you. How many of you are going to go to Madison in the next four or five years? <laughs> all right. I want you all to come to the UW-Madison Arboretum. And you can ask the receptionist at the front desk if, if you can see me. So um, we would love to have you come to the Arboretum. Um, it is truly a resource for the whole state of Wisconsin. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it before I switch to uh, monarchs here. Um, the mission of the Arboretum is to care for Arboretum land, to foster research on land restoration, and to promote a land ethic. We work to strengthen connections between people in the natural world, and that is something that all of you up here in Minocqua have in spades, um, connections between you and the natural world. What an amazing and wonderful and beautiful place to live. Um, I envy you <laughs> after spending the whole day here. So. Um, maybe you don't need to connect more with the natural world. So I've been the director of the UW-Madison Arboretum for almost five years. Um, before that, I spent about almost 30 years studying monarch butterflies. And when I told all of my monarch butterfly friends that I was taking a different job, that I wasn't going to be just focused on, on monarchs, um, people were really surprised and thought, what are you even going to do? if you don't focus your life on monarchs anymore. Um, but really, monarch conservation and, and the, bi the conservation of all biodiversity in the world really depends on the things that the Arboretum does. It depends on caring for the land. It depends on learning more about how we can take care of the land and the species that live on it and making connections between people in the natural world. So for me, it's the perfect kind of segue from focusing on one species to focusing on conservation in general. So for those of you that haven't been at the Arboretum, I do have some maps and other things along, so feel free to come up and ask me for them after. Um, the Arboretum is 1,200 acres in Madison. Um, again, it's a statewide resource. We are part of the U University of Wisconsin. And this land began to be acquired in the 1930s during the Depression. Um, when land was cheap, it was overused farmland. And it was truly a, a collaboration between the city of Madison and the university. Um, a lot of the funding to purchase the land came from people in the city, especially the Rotary Club. Um, and it, it was to provide a, a place 
for people in Madison to come to recreate and make connections with the land and also to do the kind of research that we're still doing now. So today, on those 1,200 acres in Madison, we have 45 acres of what we call gardens. Um, we have uh, the, one of the largest horticultural collections in the state. We have pretty much any kind of tree from the whole world, tree or shrub, that can grow in southern Wisconsin. Um, over 2,000 kinds of, of trees and shrubs and over 4,000 specimens. And right now, if you come, the magnolias and the tulips and the crab apples are just going to be popping. So if you are in Madison, you should definitely come. We always think of Mother's Day as the peak blooming time. But the rest of the land, besides those 45 acres, is managed as natural habitat. Um, we have savannas, we have prairies, we have the first restored prairie in the world. So that's something that we in Wisconsin can be really proud of. Um, we have wooded areas, just lots and lots of natural land, 17 miles of trails that people can walk on. Um, so I wanted to say just a couple things about the Arboretum, which has been really interesting for me coming there from a life focusing on one kind of insect. Um, I've really learned a lot about what we call adaptive management. And as a research station and a land care operation, we are com constantly learning from what we're doing. And it's, it's interesting to be there and see the result of almost 90 years of that kind of what we call adaptive management. So we've learned a lot. Um, we've learned that we can't really represent every kind of native Min Wisconsin, sorry, every once in a while I say Minnesota. <laughs> came from, <laughs> we can't re represent every kind of native Wisconsin habitat um, because it can't all live in southern Wisconsin. So when it was first developed, um, people tried to plant the kinds of pine forests that you have up here. Those pines are still there, but they're not doing very well. So we learned that, that communities, plant communities, are really adapted to specific places. The other thing we've learned is that there's a lot of outside pressure. And we are right in the middle of Madison, a lot of pressure from the outside, storm water coming in, invasive species coming in. So we're really, we, we have city problems and we're trying to come up with city solutions. So the constancy of trying to manage land um, when there are all these outside pressures. Um, we're gradually um, dealing with all of that, but it's, it's not an easy job to manage all that land in the city with five people on that 1,200 acres. Um, there's lots of public involvement. We have free naturalist-led hikes every Sunday. So if you're in Madison on a Sunday, you should come on one of our hikes. Um, lots of opportunities to participate in citizen science. So just lots of ways for the public to get involved. And the last thing I want to say about the Arboretum is that it's not only the 1,200 acres in Madison, it's 512 acres of what we call outlying properties. And most of those are in southern Wisconsin, but one of our gems is right up here. Finnerud Forest is about 10 miles straight to the west of here. Um, beautiful property that I just visited for the first time today. So we are managing 140 acres up here, um, almost, four, almost 400 acres on, down in the southern part of the state of land that we're managing. And that's land that was just, for one reason or another, given to the University of Wisconsin, and people said, here, Arboretum, take care of it. So we're doing our best with Finnerud Forest up here. That is all I was going to say about the Arboretum, unless anybody has a question, and then we're going to shift to monarchs. All right. Hope to see you all at the Arboretum. So there's a whole bunch of handouts. There are some at the back table. And if you have questions about monarchs, and I say when you ask the question, I have a handout on that, um, I can give you handouts later on. So lots of, lots of things for you. We passed out some fun facts that you can share, just kind of fun little monarch facts that we put together. Um, so before we get started, we have a few more things to give away. I have a pile of stuff here. But because it's not everyone's birthday, we have a couple, you have to answer a question to get the prize that we're going to start with here. First one, for all of you insect ecologists, what is 
grass. Oh, who said that? All right, she said, frass is a word for insect poop, and you get a set of cards that have pictures of monarchs at all stages of their life cycle. <laughs> None of them are pooping. So congratulations on, on knowing that. So frass is what we, the polite name for insect poop. And I have a bumper or a sticker on my refrigerator, refrigerator magnet that says frass happens. So, okay, next question. Um, are there more mammal species or insect species in the world? Who said that? Insect species. All right. You get book, milkweed, monarchs, and more. Not, so can you tell me about how many mammal species there are? In Wisconsin? In the world. About 8,000. 8, How about insects? Yeah. Yep. So somewhere between 1 and 10 million species of insects. We really don't know. Most of them haven't been named. So you knew. If I asked you, I'm kind of getting, coming apart here. If I asked you to name uh, mammals, to name as many mammals as you know and name as many insects as you know, you would probably, so... <laughs> it's like really coming apart. I'll take off my glasses. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Okay. You would probably be able to name a lot more mammal species than you could, would be able to name insect species, but I think you would all be able to name the monarch. Um, I think the monarch is probably the only species, the only insect that most people recognize as a species. This is really complicated here. <laughs> this is <coming> apart. <laughs> I don't know. Is it sticking on? Like these things. Okay. <laughs> okay. I won't move so much. All right. So now that we know more insect species, we know what monarch poop is called. Um, we're going to talk about the individual life cycle of monarchs. So when I think of monarch life cycles, I think of two kinds of life cycles. I think of one, what they go through as an individual, and then their annual migratory cycle. So the monarch life cycle starts as an egg. Yeah, starts as an egg. They're an egg about the size of a pinhead for four to five days. The egg hatches and becomes a caterpillar, and you can always ask to look at the life cycle cards. That, what is your name? Liz, one. Um, so they're an egg for four or five days. They hatch into a caterpillar. The caterpillar sheds its skin or molts five times during its life. That lasts about 10 to 11 days as a caterpillar. And during that time, the caterpillars increase their body mass by 2,000 times. So I want the women in this audience to think of their seven-pound babies <laughs> that they had and multiply that by 2,000 in 10 days. That's, uh, they grow really fast. Basically, all they do is eat. Okay, so they're a caterpillar for 10 to 11 days, increasing their body mass about 2,000 times. They become a pupa or a chrysalis. They're a chrysalis for about the same amount of time as they're a caterpillar. And then they become an adult, the adult monarch butterfly, like I have on my T-shirt. Um, the adult lives, depending on what time of year it's born, the adult can live one month if it's in the summer. And it lives, if it's a migratory adult, it'll live eight to ten months. So that might sound a lot better to live eight to ten months than one month, but the thing is, that they don't get to reproduce until the end of their life. And there's a lot that could happen to them. So a lot of those migratory adults never get to have any offspring because they don't make it to Mexico. They don't make it back. So it's really better to be the adult that only lives for one month. Okay, so a few things. Um, so I studied monarchs before I became the director of the Arboretum. I focus my whole life on monarchs, and I'm going to tell you a few of the most interesting things 
that I learned about them. So I started studying monarchs. I was interested in mating behavior. So I studied monarch mating for about 10 years. Um, I didn't learn everything there was to know about monarch mating in 10 years. But I'm going to tell you one really interesting thing about that is that when they're mating, they stay together for 10 to 12 hours, um, attached to each other for 10 to 12 hours. And during that time, the male is transferring more than just sperm to the female. He's transferring a big mass called a spermatophore that can be equal to 10% of his own body weight. Do the math. <laughs> so there's a lot that's going on when monarchs are mating. And you've maybe seen that. Has anyone ever seen monarchs mating? Okay, they fly through the air. Um, the male often carries the female underneath him. So that's one thing. Um, the second thing I wanted to tell you is I spent a lot of time studying parasitoids. Does anybody know what a parasitoid is? A parasitoid is an insect that lays eggs on another living insect. The eggs of the parasitoid hatch and live inside the other insect. So a lot of people are in this audience are old enough to remember the movie Alien. Um, some of you are too young. Um, but anyway, Sigourney Weaver um, had parasitoids basically inside her. So they were growing inside her, living inside her, um, and then they pop out. The difference is that when they pop out of another insect, they almost always kill it. So I studied parasitoids of monarchs. I studied a, a group of flies called tachinid flies, and then some wasps. And here's the most interesting thing I ever saw when I was studying this. I once had a monarch, and out of the monarch came a tachinid fly maggot. It had, the, its mother had laid an egg on that monarch. The maggot came out of the monarch. It made a pupa that looks like a little rabbit pellet. And then out of the rat, the pupa of the fly came a wasp. And that meant that somehow a female fly had found that monarch caterpillar and a female wasp had somehow known that there was a fly inside that monarch caterpillar and somehow it laid an egg in that monarch. It's larva, the larva of the wasp, on the larva of the fly inside the larva of the monarch, and it won. The little tiny wasp was the only one that came out of that whole interaction alive. It was smaller than a fruit fly. So that was one of the coolest things I ever observed. Um, okay, so now we're going to move from the individual life cycle that has all these things going on it. Um, there are a lot of predators besides those flies and wasps. A lot of things eat monarchs. Only 5% of them or so survive to become an adult. Female lays 100 eggs. Five of them get to be adults. And then they can partake in this annual cycle. So we're going to start right now in this annual cycle. Think spring. Right now, I'd say in about six days, the first monarchs are going to move into southern Wisconsin. And you'll get them up here probably in early June-ish, I would guess. Okay, so monarchs are going to come back here in a month. Those monarchs that are going to come into Wisconsin, into southern Wisconsin, they haven't come yet, but they'll be here soon, were born laid as eggs in probably Texas. And they went through their whole life cycle down there that I just told you about. And those adults then flew up flew through the middle of the country, right kind of along Highway 35, moving a little east, and are coming into Wisconsin. So they are the first generation of the year coming up here. And some of those will get all the way up to Minocqua. So that's generation one, born in Texas, moves north. Then they'll go through two to three non-migratory generations up here, where they just kind of fly around in no direction. Um, fill in the whole state. The population really increases in number because each female might have five that survive. So we get more and more of them population building up. And then the last generation, so at this latitude, starting on about August 15th, any monarch that emerges on August 15th or later up here will not be reproductive, but it's going to fly south, migrate all the way to Mexico. 
And those, so those butterflies that come from all over Wisconsin after August 15th are going to migrate to Mexico. They'll start in August, arrive in Mexico in early November, spend all winter in Mexico, and leave about the middle of March. Okay, they just, have, they left, they came down there, they have not reproduced yet, and they leave, they become reproductive, and move north, and they get as far north as maybe southern Kansas, but most of them die in Texas. So that's, that's the annual life cycle of monarchs. So I'm going to tell you, before I give you a few more prizes, um, my favorite interaction with monarchs was going to the overwintering sites in Mexico. And I first did that in 1996, and I've been most years since then. But they're up at about 10,000 feet. I don't know how many feet you are in elevation here, probably about 800-ish. Um, so 10,000 feet is, for those of us from Wisconsin, that's tough um, to be walking at 10,000 feet. So I walked for about um, almost two hours to get up to these sites. I was really out of breath, and I walked into this forest, and I, the, all of their wings are shut, so they look kind of brown in the trees. Um, this was a year that there were so many monarchs in those forests, and I was so tired and panting and out of breath, and I looked up and saw the monarchs and just burst into tears. And I will never, ever forget the feeling that I had when I walked into that overwintering site. And literally, I could probably see um, 100 million monarchs. It was, it was incredible. If you've ever been snorkeling or scuba diving, it's really three-dimensional. And you're just surrounded by butterflies. So it's an amazing, amazing phenomenon. Here's a fun fact about that. It is the second densest concentration of animals in the world, of, of animals of the same kind, same species. Any guesses about the most dense concentration of animals in the world? I'm looking at my insect person over there. Nope, it's not ants. Did you say that? Who said that? It is krill. Wow, no one has ever gotten that. The guy is it's the one who said it? The one sitting next. To you. All right. Good job. Give him a hand. Krill. Wow. What is your name? What is your name? Jim. The densest concentration of animals in the world is krill in the Antarctic Ocean. I can't believe you knew that. Jeez. See, I can't stand up. Yeah, you should get a prize. He gets a prize. <laughs> Here's your prize. Monarch, come play with me. <laughs> wow, that's so amazing. So now you all know that, if anyone ever asks you again. OK, so, I'm gonna, so now we can talk about monarch conservation. What is happening to monarchs? So because monarchs go to the same, all, they all, all the monarchs from the whole northeastern quarter of the United States go to the same overwintering sites in Mexico. So we can measure how the population is doing. And we don't measure it by the number of monarchs. We measure it by hectares. We count monarchs in hectares. And it's the number of trees, the number of acre, or hectares covered with trees covered with monarchs. And that year that I told you when I burst into tears after walking up that mountain was the highest ever measure. There were about 18 hectares of, of land with trees covered with monarchs. Uh, it, that was amazing. At one point, the number got down to 0.6 hectares. That was a big decline. So I saw 18 hectares and I saw 0.6 hectares. So the, we can measure how monarchs are doing by measuring this area. We don't know how most insects are doing because we can't measure them. We can't count them. There are a few kinds of butterflies that are so rare, there's you know, maybe 100 of them in the world. But most insects and a lot of species, we just don't know how they're doing. So monarchs are kind of a bellwether for what's going on with a lot of other insects. Um, the population has kind of leveled off now for the last decade. That population has been at almost three hectares with ups and downs. 
um, but it's averaging three hectares. That when I saw 18, it was averaging 10 hectares up and down year to year. So monarch numbers are really going down. Um, so one of the big focuses of my research was what is driving that? What or what what is causing that? Um, what's causing that decline? And we have enough years of data. We started measuring them in 1993. We started co counting those hectares covered with monarchs. And so we have a lot of years of data now. So we can look at things that are associated with the decline in numbers of monarchs. The biggest driver is habitat loss up here. That it's breeding habitat loss. Um, mostly in the upper Midwest is where most of those monarchs come from. And we know that one of the big sources of that loss has been there used to be a lot of milkweed growing in corn and soybean fields. Um, you don't have a lot of corn and soybeans up here, um, but most of the upper Midwest is covered with corn and soybean fields. Those fields used to have a lot of milkweed in them, and now the farmers are growing crops that are resistant to the herbicide Roundup, now a lot of other herbicides as well. So the milkweed has disappeared from corn and soybean fields. So basically, what we need to do is make up habitat. We need to make up that habitat that's been lost from these agricultural fields that weren't very good habitat for a lot of kinds of insects, but they were good habitat for monarchs because there was mil some milkweed growing in them. So um, lots of other causes of habitat loss are sprawling cities, development, um, but the big thing is the loss of, of, of milkweed from agricultural fields. Um, we are losing habitat in the overwintering sites as well, um, but that's not as, it, that's not as closely associated with the decline in monarch numbers. But we have basically already lost all of that habitat in the corn and soybean fields. By the mid aughts, you know, by about 2005, most farmers were using Roundup Ready corn and soybeans, so we stopped losing habitat. We got down to a certain point, we stopped losing more because it was all already lost. So now, in the last about 15 years, the biggest driver of the monarch population is weather. So we know that hot and dry conditions are bad for monarchs and cold and wet conditions are bad for monarchs. Monarchs are like Goldilocks. Um, they like it right in the middle, not too hot, not too cold, not too wet, and not too dry. So we know what's, what's the big driver now is weather. And unfortunately, the biggest the weather that's predicted under climate change models is not good for monarchs. So what that means is that we need habitat in as many places as possible. Because as we learned last summer, weather... You know, we, can, we have change in climate, but weather occurs very locally. The West was burning up. It was hot and dry in the West. It was pretty cool and wet in the Northeast. We were kind of normal last summer in Wisconsin. So if we have habitat in as many places as possible, they're going to find something that's good for them. So having a lot of habitat as much as we can all over is good. Um, using insecticides. Uh, the insecticides that people use to spray for mosquitoes, um, other insect pests, are, are not just specific to mosquitoes. They are specific to insects. So decreasing insecticide use is important. I just read a new paper that is coming out in a couple days. Um, it, it had a preprint that lights at night are bad for monarchs. Um, it's difficult for them to migrate. They don't get the right cues because um, they don't normally migrate at nighttime. So a lot of nighttime light is bad for monarchs and birds and a lot of other things. So lots of things we know, and using that information, which is why re research is so, so important, will help us to help monarchs. There's a few handouts back there of things you can do. So I'm just going to end, before I give away my last two presents here, um, is with some what we can do, what you as a person can do to help monarchs. Um, one thing you can, most important, is create and protect habitat in your yards. If you have lawn in your yard, it would be good to take that lawn out and put in some habitat for monarchs and all the other species that they share habitat with. Um, if you don't have a yard, you can 
do it at your local nature center or your church or your school or your place of business, lots of opportunities. You can engage in monarch citizen science. So there's a handout out there and they asked me only to talk for 20 minutes, so I can't really tell you all the details of that, but there are a lot of ways that you can help collect data on monarchs. And I'm just gonna throw out one here. That's Journey North, it's a program of the Arboretum. And this is a program, so when you see your first monarch this year, when they finally make it up to Manaqua, see your first monarch, report it. Just search for the website Journey North and report it. And that's how we track how monarchs are doing. And you can go there tonight and look where they are. That's how I know they're not in Wisconsin yet. So report the monarchs that you see to a citizen science project. Support conservation groups who are working on habitat conservation. Um, big ones like Nature Conservancy across the whole country, um, local nature centers, any organization that's working on habitat protection. And that's gonna help monarchs, but a lot of other species as well. And finally, now that you've heard me talk for 20 minutes, you are a monarch expert. Um, plus you're an expert on krill. Uh, <laughs> Such a, you got more than you bargained for tonight. Um, so spread the word. Tell other people. Um, you know, you can't, you can't get mad at people for their lawns, but you can say, maybe you could put in a few native plants right there. So spread the word. Four things you can do. All right, before I take your questions, I have a question for you. Um, what are Lepidoptera? I have not heard it quite yet. Lepidoptera. No, that's a lepidopterist. You were close. Butterflies and moths, right. So butterflies are related to moths and they're all in a group called Lepidoptera. So you get a book called Milkweed Visitors. Congratulations. All right. So, all right, here's my last question. I have so many questions up here. This one is for somebody who has kids. Um, what colors are monarch caterpillars? Three of them. Yellow, no, not yellow, green, and black. Yellow, white, and black. You got it. It took a couple tries, but you got it. <laughs> So it's interesting that you first said green because um, a lot of people think they're green. They're not. All right, that's it. So now I'm happy to answer your questions. Okay. If I, if I you have can hear me. the mic here for anybody, and I'll just remind everybody to talk straight into the top of the mic rather than the side. My understanding is that there are a variety of, of uh, migration pathways. Are, is it just three, or is it sort of like West Coast, Central, and, and East Coast, or what? Great question. So his question, yeah, qu you heard his question. Um, are there a variety of migratory pathways? So in North America, we have two main populations of monarchs, the Eastern migratory population that goes to Mexico, Central Mexico, and the Western migratory population that's west of the Rocky Mountains and goes to sites along the coast of California. Um, so they're not completely distinct populations because some monarchs from the West go to the sites in California, but they're fairly separate populations. And it's mostly those two. Yeah, good question. Yeah. So when, when monarchs, are, oh, sorry. When monarchs are um, migrating, how many miles per day are they flying? And are they really up in the jet stream or are they below that? Great question. So where do monarchs fly? Um, so we have never tracked one monarch for a whole day. That, that's hard to do. But we can time them you know, as they're flying and, and extrapolate from there. So we think on average they fly about 50 miles a day. That's why it takes them two and a half months to get to Mexico. Um, and they fly, so it's brilliant how they do it. They fly at the right height. So depending on the wind, if there's a south wind and they're trying to go, if there's a, no, a wind from the south and they're trying to fly south, they'll fly really close to the ground. But they'll find the best elevation to fly, and they actually use thermals like birds do. And I've watched that happening 
or you know how you see hawks using thermals. So what monarchs do is they use thermals. So if there's hot air coming off, for example, a, a parking lot or a dark area, the, the hot air will be rising. And the monarchs use that and they just soar up. And then most of their migratory flight is soaring instead of using powered flight by flapping their wings. So they'll use the air currents to go up like on, around mountains or where, they, where it's hot. And then they'll go down and then go up again and go down. It's brilliant. Um, so again, we don't know exactly how high they can fly. So they'll find the best place, but there was a guy who studied monarch migration named David Gibault, and he was actually a hand glider pilot, and he saw them two kilometers up. So they can go up as high as two kilometers, so over a mile. But, you know, how often they do that, again, we, we can't put... Like on bird, birds are heavy enough that we can really study their flight in detail. There's nothing that's light enough, so yet to really study that kind of detail with monarchs. Mm -hmm. About five years ago, I planted my wildflower seed packet from Ace Hardware, and six milkweed plants sprouted from it. And now I have monarch butterflies. How did they find my milkweed plants? So that is a really good question. Um, and we don't know exactly. So we're still trying to study the answer to that question. But here's how I think of it. I think of monarchs moving north in kind of a wave. It's not like they're flying along a specific pathways. They're just kind of, there's wave of monarchs moving north. And they'll find... Um, some years you might, they might find your yard, and some years they might not. And I think it's just kind of random chance. So the bigger your yard is, or if you have neighbors that have some milkweed, they might be more likely to come. We don't know the distance from which they can perceive milkweed. We know that they can perceive milkweed first using their eyes, and then as they get closer to it, they can use scent. So they can see it, and people say to me, it's so hard to see milkweed from a distance, but I can see milkweed from a distance, and my reproductive success does not depend on finding milkweed. <laughs> so it's really not that surprising to me that monarchs can see it from a pretty long distance. They can, they can perceive it. Yeah. I had a chance to visit the Rosaria area mm -hmm. also in, I think, the early 90s. And then, um, well, let me just say, the people are so reverent. You know, they make you be quiet, um, you know, when you're in the presence of any of the monarchs. It's just wonderful, you know, how devoted they are. And, and of course, it's a great treasure. Um, at that time, they were very concerned about the decline and the fact that the rainforests were being bought off and chopped down and, you know, marketed. Um, did you, So it's interesting that you saw such an abundance. D did something happen to stabilize, you know, that situation? Um, yeah, that's an excellent question. So what's going on in Mexico to protect the overwintering sites? So um, I have to think of how much I want to tell you about this, because I, I could talk about this for an hour, but... Luckily, I won't. But um, so the land that the monarchs overwinter on in Mexico has a completely different land tenure system than we even have anywhere in the United States. It's collectively owned. So after the revolution in Mexico, there were big hacienda, big Spanish holdings, um, people that had come in and they owned, heck, you know, thousands of hectares. And that land was confiscated by the Mexican government after the revolution. And it was given to groups of people. So a group of people would apply collectively to own the land. And, and mo most land, I don't know if most, but a lot of land in Mexico is owned by these groups that are called, the word for it, we, it can't translate because we don't have it in English, is ejido. And the ejidos own the land where the monarchs overwinter. So it's not, it, it is protected by the government. So the government, it, there was a presidential decree in 1986 and then another one in 2000 
to protect that land. And But it's not like in this country where our protected land is often owned by the government or a nonprofit organization, or it's in a land easement. There the government um, basically said to the people, this is your land, but we're going to control what can be done on it. So there's um, some controversy around that. And I would 100% agree with you. The people are very reverent. They love having the monarchs on their land. But there is some tension with the federal government who has declared this a protected area, a sanctuary, but the people aren't compensated. So one of the things that we've done with a, a nonprofit group I have called the Monarch Butterfly Fund is we funded um, a, the development of a, a big fund that eventually got fund, funding from the Packard Foundation. And that money um, pays the local, it's a little bit like our CRP program in the United States where it pays the local people not to cut the trees down. And that's kind of what's happening is they're now getting compensated for the limitations that have been placed on their land because the monarchs are there. So long answer to your question, but it's wonderful that you got to see that. It is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, was there a, a disappearance linked to any of that in Mexico by a famous conservationist for monarchs that you're aware of? Yeah, I remember so, story. Yeah, so there was a story that got a lot of international press, um, and it. So now that I've explained to you what ejidos are, he was the president of one of the ejidos of the Rosario ejido where this woman had visited. Um, so, and he was killed a couple years ago. We don't know, and it, I think that the evidence is pretty strong that his death had nothing to do with monarchs or monarch conservation. Um, it was really unfortunate. I knew him, um, but it, it probably had nothing to do with the fact that he worked on monarchs. Um, he wasn't really involved in monarch conservation. He was the president of, of that group that owned some of the land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, kind of a two-part question, but it has to do with um, I raised native plants mm -hmm. and four species of monarch butterflies at one time that are native to Wisconsin. I'm sorry. Four species Mo of milkweed. Milkweed, I'm okay. sorry. Four <laughs> species of milkweed. And I grew up in southwest Wisconsin that um, I saw what happened to agriculture. And one of the things you said the common milkweed lives was in the agriculture fields. Actually, it was wasn't in the fields, it was adjacent to the fields. So when we, bigger combines, bigger tractors equipment, we got rid of that edge of habitat, which is, was also for non-native pheasants. We lost so much because of agriculture and CRP came, what, came along and that went to the side because egg land got, was worth more to be, be farmed. But my question is, these cycles that you're talking about. You said it's tied to uh, our habitat loss where they spend the summer. Or here in Wisconsin, I'm one, and it's moisture related. My big fee feeling is, um, does your data and research cover the 10 year, 11 year wet drought cycle in Wisconsin? Are those factors considered in your moisture dryness? Because I think we need to do a lot more looking at that cycle. Um, I don't care if it's aquatic or whatever habitat it is. Um, so I guess I question all the science we're doing. And you being the director of the Arboretum, what, what do you call applied? What was the um, purpose of adaptive? Adaptive management. OK. Mm -hmm. And adaptive management was Aldo Leopold. To this day, I spent the last four years reading everything I could about Leopold. He was the first director of the Arboretum. Correct, correct. But his philosophy was we spend so much time studying something, and the longer we study it and the ecosystems lose parts of it, it's harder to correct. So he was one for observing adaptive management and making corrections in the system as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. So 
what are we doing with butterflies? Okay, monarch butterflies. Are we getting to the point we've recognized it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we got four 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 um, species of butterflies in Wisconsin, and no I end up no mm -hmm. here. I keep on saying it. Ah, I get yeah, keep me separate. Um, and I gave them all to my daughter. She she planted her whole yard, and she's probably does twenty chrysalises. My granddaughters were raised with them, but what I see happening, I always thought red milkweed, marsh milkweed was so much better than common milkweed. And then on top of that, a uh, butterfly weed on a sandy, sandy soil that she has is even better yet. So can you address which species someone should raise to okay. help the butterflies the most? Well, you had a lot of questions there, <laughs> but I wrote them down. So first of all, about milkweed in cornfields, it was in the cornfields. And I, I was there in walking through those cornfields. And if it is not easy to walk through cornfields that are taller than you. So there was, it was not as dense in the cornfields as it was in that edge habitat. So we measured it. We had a study that was in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, Maryland, and Ontario. Um, so we went out into... 87 different corn and soybean fields. So I, I will argue with that, that there was milkweed in those fields because I have the data to prove it. Um, but you're right that there was more in the edges. But just because there is so much more corn and soybean habitat, most monarchs were coming out of that habitat. They've moved. They've had to move because it's gone. Um, and so the edges, you are so right that those edges are gone in a lot of cases. So now we can see cornfields um, that are a mile square, you know, a, a whole section that's covered with corn and soybeans with no edges in there anymore. So that has been a huge loss, losing that habitat. Um, and then, you know, it's really interesting what you said about research. And... Um, I, so one of the things I think about a lot is, I think you're right that a lot of scientists document things. And it's like we document declines. It's like Nero fiddling while Rome burns. And that, you know, I think more and more scientists have realized that that isn't tenable because things are changing so quickly that in some cases, we're going to need to act with imperfect knowledge. And that's a really hard thing to say to a scientist. But I agree with you 100% that we, we need to do things even if we're not 100% sure exactly how we should do them, that just doing something is going, to, is going to be better than just studying it. So I couldn't agree with you more there. Um, and then, then your last question, which is a little easier to answer. Those were hard questions, those first ones. Um, which milkweed species should we plant? So great that you grew four species. One of the handouts in the back is um, from the Monarch Collaborative of, of Wisconsin. It lists all the species that grow in Wisconsin. And really, the species of milkweed that's the best is the one that grows the best in a particular location. And monarchs, um, if the red milkweed or the swamp milkweed, it's often called red milkweed, um, kind of a new, more attractive name for it than swamp milkweed. But that, um, that milkweed will do really well in wet areas. So th that is something, if you're in a wet area, you should plant that. Um, at the end of the season, there's maybe one of the species you, you grew was called whirled milkweed. Um, that one has indeterminate growth, which means that it just keeps growing all summer long. So monarchs, even at the end of the season in August, when everything else is dry and yucky looking, that still has some nice green growth on it. Um, common milkweed is great at the beginning of the season. So there, but what I recommend is, you know, when people say, which kind should I plant, plant as many as you can. And then in some summers, one will be doing well. Another summer, the other one will be doing well. Up on the hill, that one will be doing well. So diversity is good. So yay that you grew three, four kinds. That's, that's the best thing to do. Yeah. The butter, butterfly weed, yep. 
Yeah, so people will say they don't like butterfly weed. I've seen a ton of caterpillars on butterfly weed. So, yep, they, they just find the best one. And that's going to vary from location to location and time to time. All right. How is it possible that the last generation from August of the monarchs know where to migrate to having never been there? And then how specific is their targeting? I've heard legend that the monarchs end up maybe even in the same tree that their forebears were in. And I don't know how you'd study that. You couldn't. Yeah. So really good question. Um, first of all, the, there, we, we kind of know the answer to that question, but not totally. So monarchs know that it's time to migrate by environmental cues. So during their development, as the days are getting shorter, so it's not absolute day length, it's the change in day length. That's one of the things I studied in my lab. So as the days are getting shorter, the monarchs are getting that cue and knowing when they emerge, they're not going to be reproductive, they're going to migrate. Um, there are other cues like the difference between daytime and nighttime temperature. So in August, days are getting shorter. It can be really hot, but often our nights are cooler because they're longer, so they get cooler. So they're using the difference between day and nighttime temperature, and they're also using the condition of the milkweed. And those cues are kind of additive for them. So they, um, they take all those cues from the environment, and that says, okay, time to migrate. How they know to migrate, so we know on a really gross scale, we know how they know to migrate south. So if you imagine yourself and you want to head south and it's morning, you should keep the sun on your left. If it's afternoon, you should keep the sun on your right. So they have a clock, they know what time of day it is, and they can sense where the sun is. And so that's how they know where is south. But if you are a monarch and you're in Wisconsin, or you're a monarch and you're in Massachusetts, um, you, need to know you need to know where you are to know how to get to the right place. So that we don't know. And they do find the exact same spots in Mexico, like you surmised. We, we don't know if they're going to the same spot there like four generations back went, probably not because there's a lot of different monarchs that have been four generations back for them. They've got great grandparents and great great grandparents. You know, by there's like 12 ancestors four generations back. So um, we, in my opinion, they're probably um, not. There, they're probably some rules that they're following that we don't understand yet. So it might be. Go south until you hit an ocean, and then go west, and then go south again. Um, we, we just don't know what those rules are, but they must have rules because they don't learn. That was one of the questions I was going to ask you. Do they learn to migrate? They don't. It's genetically programmed somehow, but it's probably not genetically programmed. You know, somehow you're going to search for this exact spot on the map. It's probably more of some kind of rules that they can have um, that allow them to do that. It's amazing. And it's, you know, I've been studying monarchs for 35 years, and we've learned so much in that time, but we have not, that's like the, you know, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow in the monarch world, um, but nobody's figured that out. It's going to take, like, some super brilliant person to figure out how to ask the right questions, and get those answered. Yeah. We have a question from our online audience. What are the viable alternatives to neonectinoid pesticides, and are farmers motivated to use them? Yeah, so neonicotinoid pesticides are, or neonix, are pesticides that you put in a, that is systemic in the plant. So, like it's what people are using to treat against emerald ash borers. They're using a drip around the plant and the plant takes that up in the roots and it goes in all of the tissues of the plant. So often if you buy a, a plant at um, Home Depot or something, it often has been treated with neonicotinoids or neonics just because um, people don't like to buy plants that insects have been eating. So we know that 
plants that have been treated with neonicotinoids are toxic to herbivores that would eat them. So if it's milkweed, they would be toxic to the, to the caterpillars. Um, also, the neonicotinoids can go into the nectar. So, um, so that's, that's what a neonic is. Um, what are the alternatives? So um, agricultural use of neonicotinoids probably is not that harmful to monarchs because it's not sprayed. So monarchs don't eat, and milkweed so far is not an agricultural crop. So neonics aren't harmful to monarchs in making their host plant toxic. Um, they, they're usually treated in agriculture, like in, on broad scales, they're used in agriculture as a coating on seeds, and then the, it, it's taken up by corn plants as the corn is growing. So the only way that could harm monarchs is if it um, gets blown off of the seeds during planting and gets into the other habitat. So neonics themselves, agricultural use of neonics is not harmful to monarchs. It can be harmful to a lot of other insects. You know, what are the alternatives? Um, that is a really good and hard question. It is possible to grow plants without, to grow crops without, I'm looking at you because <laughs> I know. Um, I, I don't know the person online. Thank you, person online, for that question. Um, it, it's possible but difficult to grow plants without insecticides. And, you know, the way I think about that is if, if we, you know, if, if, if you're a person who can afford to buy organic food, then I would recommend doing it because that food was not grown using insecticides. So there are definitely alternatives. Um, the, and and it, it leads, you know, insects cause damage to crops. But there are, are ways we can grow um, more diversity of crops so so many insects aren't attracted to the same place. So there are ways to do agriculture a lot better than we do it now. Um, so, yeah, organic agriculture is, is the alternative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, with the insecticides, with the insecticides, um, like the mosquito doctor and uh, the golf courses spray and... Um, it's supposed to detour the mosquitoes, but not kill them. Now, is that true, or is it hurting the monarchs and the other butterflies, the bees? Mm -hmm. the, what is your opinion on that? Yeah, so I actually studied that. Um, there is a whole class of insecticides called um, pyrethroids, which are very commonly used insecticides in mosquito spray. And they can be applied as um, an ultra-fine mist. So that's fogging, basically. So when an area is fogged. Um, and that can kill mosquitoes. Um, it, it can also deter them. But it also, it's not specific to mosquitoes. So it's, it kills a lot of other insects as well. Um, with Monarch, so I did a study and I actually worked with a mosquito control district in the Twin Cities metropolitan area. And we um, studied, you know, normal spray volume of these insecticides. They don't outright kill Monarchs because they're a pretty big insect as insects go. Um, they led to shorter lifespans and lower egg production. Um, the ones that killed monarchs were the ones, so there, that's one kind of spray. And then there's another kind of spray that's called a barrier spray, which doesn't, it's, it's used like if you imagine a soccer field with um, woods around it and maybe some milkweed plants growing on the edge of that. And they'll spray the pyrethroid as a, as a surface coating. So it goes onto the plants on the edge of a soccer field and that keeps the mosquito the mosquitoes from kind of going it acts as a barrier but it goes onto the plants and it's specifically um, formulated so that it it is resistant to evaporation it has an oil in it that keeps it from evaporating off of the plants and it also has something in it that makes it not degrade in sunlight 
So it remains on. And that, I, when I studied that, the milkweed that was sprayed um, was toxic to monarchs for at least 21 days after it was sprayed. It stopped working for insects a lot faster than that, or for mosquitoes. Exactly. That's why we couldn't measure it for more than that amount of time, because then they sprayed again. Um, so, yeah, that is toxic. And the mosquito joes, they're often using pyrethroids. That's usually what they use. Um, it has low toxicity, not zero toxicity to people. But the only case, so I did a lot of reading the literature, medical literature, on whether that was harmful to people. And there was a case I read about where a woman had a phobia of spiders. And she, like, sprayed her house. She just kept spraying because she just didn't want any spiders in her house. And that's the only case of somebody, well, the, uh, the only case then, there have been a few more cases more recently, of somebody actually dying from pyrethra, a person, yeah. But normally it's not that harmful to people, yeah. So I would not recommend, I mean, you know, it's not just monarchs, but um, those mosquito control, that would kill um, fireflies in your yard or keep them out of your yard and bees and, you know, a lot of things that are really good. Yeah, a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. My question is about the native prairie flowers. You mentioned butterfly weed. Um, I've been trying to incorporate them into my own yard, partly because of monarchs and other beneficial insects, but the one I hadn't heard mentioned, but that I have from a prairie plant sale six, seven years ago, and it took a while to get established. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Leatris? Leatris, yep. Leatris. And it's like, I think a meadow. I don't remember the exact type, but mm -hmm. it, and I'm wondering how it benefits the monarchs in a, you know, outside of the milkweed and that, because in the fall, I've had up to 36 monarchs on this one plant. Flower. Yeah. So that plant, Meadow Blazing Star, is like monarch candy. Um, they love it. There can be a whole prairie full of a whole bunch of other stuff and one of those and the monarchs will just find it. So we don't know what so, I mean, it must be really good for them or maybe it's really bad. <laughs> maybe it is like candy, but they just love it. So, and thank you for asking that question because I really didn't say enough about other plants. So monarchs eat milkweed when they're caterpillars, but when they're adults, they eat nectar from many, many kinds of flowers. So just having flowers around is always going to benefit monarchs. And that is a late summer, early fall, that meadow blazing star, and they love it. So if you want to see monarchs in your yard, often you know, I, I'm not sure I've ever seen 36 on one plant, but I've seen a dozen. Yeah, it's it's an incredible. And the other butterflies like it, bees, it's a great plant. Yeah, Meadow Blazing Star, remember that one. 40 years ago, I saw a ball of monarch butterflies on an oak branch, that, and that ball must have been five feet tall and four feet around. And uh, it was in the August or September, um, or do they do that to keep warm, or do they do that to ball up before they migrate? Where were you? In Bywater Town, Wisconsin. Okay, so that is the, you are so lucky to have seen that, first of all. When monarchs are migrating, and I, I don't know the real answer to your question. When monarchs are migrating, they will often at nighttime congregate to, on certain trees. And there are places, um, when I worked at the University of Minnesota, this woman called me and she lived in a little tiny town in central Minnesota. And she lived in the house that her grandma had lived in. And every fall, the monarchs, she remembered this as a child and it was still happening, you know, 40 years later. So sometimes it's a one-off event that, that people will see this. And sometimes it's year after year. So what we do know about that is that they stop at night. And we don't know if they're finding each other. You know, if one monarch stopped on that oak branch and then, the other, you know, another buddy saw it and they all just started coming and it was, you know, just the 
something that they were attracted to each other or if there was something special about that tree or that individual location. We don't know what causes that, but it's an incredible phenomenon. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, so it must have been evening. Yeah. So they'll just stay there and they'll have to be really highly disturbed to leave that tree at nighttime. That's why lights at night aren't good for them because they need that time to rest. So, yeah, they'll aggregate. In Mexico, there can be 100,000 monarchs on one tree. I once caught a branch that was kind of the size of my torso or put all the butterflies on that branch in a net. It was 1,000 monarchs fit in a area. You know, it was amazing. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So because of the continuing monarch decline, I believe last year they were considered on the endangered species list. And could you talk about that? I mean, they didn't get selected yet, they said, I think. Yeah. But what impact would that have if they were put on that list? <sighs> Good question. Um, so she asked about monarchs being federally listed. So in 2014, um, a group mostly led by the Xerces Society, which is a group for invertebrate conservation, petitioned to the Fish and Wildlife Service to have monarchs listed as a threatened species, which would give them the protection of the Endangered Species Act. Um, it took a long time. That decision was finally announced in early 2021. And as you said, they were not selected to be listed. Um, they were listed in a special category called warranted but precluded. So what the Fish and Wildlife Service determined is that their numbers were declining enough that they, were, they warranted protection of the Endangered Species Act, but they didn't get it because there were so many species worse off than them. So that's, that's what happened with that. And the second part of your question what would have happened if they had been listed? Um, federal listing under the Endangered Species Act is not supposed to have anything to do with the consequences of listing something. It is only supposed to be based on how that species is doing. Um, but that said, if monarchs had been, there, there's never been a species like monarchs listed under the Endangered Species Act. Usually, when a species is listed, it's very easy to define its habitat. It usually is in kind of a prescribed location and uses a certain kind of habitat, but monarchs use all kinds of habitat. So what it would have meant, so once the Fish and Wildlife Service lists something as endangered, then they have to come up with rules that tell people how to respond to that listing. You know, what, what are the behavior, human behaviors that are precluded by that protection. And that would have been very difficult for monarchs. It would have been very interesting. I mean, um, I think, so here's my personal opinion on this. Um, in my opinion, the Endangered Species Act is probably one of the most important environmental pieces of legislation we have in terms of habitat protection. Because if a species is listed, then we have to protect its habitat. And that is so important. There have been a lot of pieces of really incredible habitat protected because of the Endangered Species Act. So it's a, it's a law that we have in the United States that's really important. It is under a lot of threat. Um, there, there are a lot of people that don't like the Endangered Species Act. So in some ways, it's, it's maybe good that they weren't listed because it would have been so complicated. It would have brought out some of the weaknesses and problems of the Endangered Species Act. But it's still so important that we protect that legislation. So if they ever, if it ever comes up for, you know, if, if ever... Congress thinks we should overrule the Endangered Species Act, then we should write to our legislators. Okay. I've been a nurse for 
59 years. And when I, back in the early 60s, it was very rare to hear of anyone with Parkinson's disease. Now we all know somebody with it. And it's um, a neurological disease. They're not quite sure what causes it yet. But maybe 20 years ago, Iowa had the highest incidence of Parkinson's disease because it was farming communities. And they were all using neurotoxic pesticides, which have eliminated our pollinators and our monarchs. And if we're not careful, those pesticides are going to eliminate us, or at least make us so that we can't function well. So I think we need to take really good care of not using them for anything if we can avoid it. Because we're inhaling it, we're ingesting it in our GMO products that's built right in, so we're getting it just as well as the monarchs and the other pollinators. That's a, a really good ending. Thank you for that. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Karen Oberhauser. Wasn't that great? Thanks, everyone, for coming, and thanks especially for your questions. Um, thanks to our sponsors, the Lakeland Badger Chapter of the Wisconsin Alumni Association, Kemp Natural Resources Station, Trout Lake Station, Monaco Public Library, WXPR, the Brittingham Fund. I don't know if I got everybody. And our hosts here, the pizzeria. Next event, next October, we'll send you an email. Don't forget to sign up for email uh, and, uh, reminders. There's a piece of paper in the back to sign up. And there are also a bunch of handouts from the Arboretum and about Monarchs. Thanks again. Have a great summer. We'll see you in the fall. <laughs>